5.15, come hell or high water, you will have your reception. And I don't want to get in the way of the reception. So um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Isaac Kohane. Everybody calls me Zach. I'm by training. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. I'm a uh, very part-time practicing pediatric endocrinologist. I'm uh, the co-director of the Center of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. And in the fit of insanity, I also agreed to take on the uh, County Library of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and turn it into an information institute. And we'll see where that goes. And so for all these reasons, um, this uh, notion of books, biology, and the bedside is one that uh, resonates with me uh, greatly because, in fact, that's the way my research uh, and my interests have gone. And although um, I'm involved in a few different uh, kinds of research projects, we do have one special project uh, on the autism spectrum disorders. And I'm going to use this, um, this uh, unfortunate disease as an illustration of how we are actually using computing, not as a tool to help us do the investigations, but as the primary investigative driver and, uh, of our research. All right. So first, we're going to give you a background of what is autism. Then I'll describe the multimodal approach that we're using, the multimodal computational approach that we're using to investigate autism. And then I'll discuss um, opportunities for uh, collaboration. So autism is a spectrum disorder. A lot of people have seen Rain Man, or I'm beginning to realize I'm old. Some people have seen Rain Man when uh, Tom Cruise was still sane. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, that's only one end of what's actually somewhere in the middle to high functioning end of autism spectrum. A lot of individuals with autism spectrum are uh, children who have uh, severe cognitive disabilities in addition to um, the usual diagnostic criteria, which are impairment of social interaction, impairment of communication, restrict, restri restricted and repetitive behaviors, like uh, they'll do some sort of uh, repetitive obsessive compulsive behavior, very focused interests. And um, it's not escaped uh, a number of uh, investigators noticed that this absence of social interaction, impairment of communication, and maybe a little bit of this looks a lot like some of the computer nerds that uh, we've uh, grown up uh, with. And in fact, it's been said that if both your, uh, as, the, well, as we'll get to it, there's a strong genetic component to autism spectrum disorder, and I'll give you the exact concordance figures uh, shortly, but just as a factoid, it's been estimated that if both your parents are MIT faculty, the chance of you having uh, the, the mild end of autism spectrum disorder is as high as 20 percent, uh, which is actually, yeah, and, uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of my grad students are MIT grad students. It, uh, somehow it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's, but it, but the point, though, is there's, at least in the modern world, a selective advantage uh, to this. And it's perhaps only when a certain number of genes go together in a completely bad way that you actually have a problem. And, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So it's definitely part of the neurological uh, development cycle because it's, it's imperceptible um, at birth, and often children will uh, only be diagnosed um, as late as four, five, six, or later. And in fact, now we can probably diagnose them as early as two to three years of age. Some just stay at a certain level of functioning, and some sadly even regress, lose some of their verbal uh, capabilities. And uh, it used to be said that it was as little as one in 1,000. Now it's thought to be somewhere between uh, one in 250, to, and in fact, I saw a, a figure of one in 116. Now, you have to be careful about these figures because there's a strong financial interest to lump everything into the autism uh, spectrum disorder, uh, both for the way these kids are handled in school and the way federal funding is allocated. So they try to, so there are good reasons to pump up the statistics. But I think it's fair to say, based at least on my meta-analysis, that it's somewhere around 1 in 300 to 1 in 200, which puts it way beyond uh, most of the monogenic diseases that we care about. The most frequent monogenic disease that we know of is hematochromatosis, which is iron depo deposition disease in the liver, and that's, I think, 1 in 300. 
And so it's a significant disease, and if, God forbid, it's in your family, uh, then you know the adage, uh, you're never happier than your saddest kid. And what's sadder about autism is that we really don't know what causes it. And we don't know what uh, causes things, then um, science begins to look more like superstition. So in the 1950s, for instance, it was thought that um, it was the cold withholding mothers uh, that actually were the cause, the cause of uh, autism. It was, a, it was the a dominant theory, uh, for probably by some of the psychoanalysts who live around us here in Cambridge. And um, I kid you not. And what's ironic, and I'll jump ahead, is that it looks very much like a um, male dominant disease, four to five, uh, four, four out of five individuals who are male have, uh, are, uh, four out of five out of individuals who have autism are male, and furthermore, whatever, we have hints that this is being transmitted through, through male. So in fact, and if you, in fact you look at uh, some of the um, phenotypes of the parents, because it goes in families, it's actually the fathers who, who actually are a little bit on the Asperger's mild autism side and not the mothers. But because of the sociological biases, these superstitions um, took the place of science. Then there's been other things that, which have been uh, tried and they just don't pan out, prenatal and neonatal you know, viral, uh, viral infection. And of course, most recently, um, immunization. I, and I, I, I would rather not be forced to discuss this except to say that there are several countries in Europe, for instance, which uh, stopped uh, uh, using mercury in their uh, vaccines quite a while ago and the autism rates keep on going up. And so it's unlikely to be the cause. And what? So there is a, a, a very, when you have a child with autism, you're very, very angry because a horrible thing happened to your family and um, you don't know why. And what then happens is that um, you look back about what happened before you noticed the kid had, uh, before the kid was diagnosed. And guess what? When you're an infant, you're getting a shot about every two to three months. So there's always a, previous, a shot that came before it. And so there's become a whole, um, industry of belief around uh, immunizations. The question was what Asperger's relation to Oh, sorry. Asperger's is on the mild end of autism spectrum disorder. I apologize. Thank you. I missed it. misunderstood. One of the common techniques for looking at a genetic cause for something that's supposed to be genetic is to look at um, a population of affected versus unaffected individuals and looking at variants across the genome and seeing what is the relative frequency um, of these variants in, uh, in the affected population. And so you can hear, see a spike here, a spike here, a spike here. And that lo all looks like signal. These might be areas in the genome where you might expect to have um, a gene that causes autism. But then, if you do, when nobody comes up with any gene, you, re you repeat this, uh, these genome scans Again and again, there's been 10 genome-wide scans done in autism. And all these different markers and all these different chromosomes and have been implicated. And unfortunately, uh, only two or three of those peaks have been replicated across all these studies. And there's a variety of reasons why we've achieved this Babel Tower of genomic studies. <coughs> part of it um, has to do with measurement, but part of it is actually the lack of use of uh, computing it really as a means of integrating or triangulating uh, all this data, and that's going to be one of the foci of uh, my talk today. Other important things you should know is the, and I recognize that uh, the last guy who spoke about sex-based uh, cognitive bias uh, on this campus was fired, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take that risk. Um, th there was a nice study that appeared in Science, I think it was uh, la last year, and um, they're, I think, out of Oxford University, and they looked at a, a variety, um, an empathy quotient score versus a, um, this is basically a, a sort of uh, objective uh, evidence kind of uh, 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 score. I can't remember what the S stand for right now. And um, what they see is that, as you see, the control males are in this middle area, but there's a dabbling of extreme, of extreme uh, S scores in these um, males. And furthermore, you see the, the females are shifted. I mean, this is great overlap. They're shifted towards the 
of the empathy, uh, qu uh, high empathy quotient scores. The Asperger's um, autism group, though, as you see, has shifted in this direction very heavily, um, raising the question of this, quote, extreme male brain. And of course, there's lots of uh, late night jokes about these uh, qualities of uh, men, you know, not listening, uh, not good social contact, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's an argument that some of those qualities are being exaggerated in these individuals. And in fact, there's a number of genomic studies, well, genetic studies, where they've looked at gene expression in uh, parts of the brain that are, in fact, enhanced, for instance, in the left part of the brain in males. And so all this is going to, going to say that not only um, is this a disease in which you have four times as many more affected males as females, but the behavioral slash social interaction path pattern is shifted towards this extreme male region. And so currently, what's the best vague guess of what this is all about? Uh, that it's a complex trait, that is, it involves mutations in many genes, that it has a strong inherited uh, component, that if you're a monozygotic twin, your chance of having uh, autism is greater than 90%. So if what your twin got it, you're likely to get it. Uh, dizygotic twins have a concordance of a 4.5%. So that, that tells you the following, which is although genetics are important, the fact that it's only 4.5% um, in dizygotic twins tells you that environment also plays a role. They, they're siblings? Siblings, it's about 3%. And previously, uh, we've revisited a lot of families and where they had one individual. And in closer probing, there's a lot more multiplex families than we thought, you know, where in one subtree, there's a uh, kid with autism, and in another subtree, there's an adult uh, with autism. Are these the twins living in different environments for the same time? Uh, this is a combination. It's not that fine-grained, I and I understand the, the point of your question. And by the way, the point of this talk is not about autism. Well, the meat of this talk is going to be how we approach understanding autism using computational tools. And so it's developmental, and what we know now is that early on in your life, you have a lot of um, connections using dendrites between different neurons. And part of the learning process, part of the environmental interaction with the development brain is actually a pruning process. And so you have some of these dendritic spines, these little spikes of the dendrites that make connection with other neurons, actually get pruned back during the learning process. And in fact, it seems that this, that pruning process is part of what's affected in autism. And that's perhaps, now this is sort of uh, wishy-washy neuroscience, um, why they have such difficulty with uh, stimuli and they try to reduce, they, they're bothered by uh, bright lights and sounds and they try to actually soothe themselves by giving these sort of uh, more uh, steady, low-key sim stimuli from themselves. So having given you this introduction to autism, let me try to um, tell you the approach that we're taking as part of the uh, Boston Autism, autism Consortium, which includes people at Children's Hospital, at MIT, at MGH, at the Broad, at the Tufts, and BU. And so we're approaching it by looking at neurological function, genetics, environment, behavioral, and cognitive milieu. But what's bringing all this together is a um, is an intersection between the uh, wet biology techniques, what we know already about gene uh, process interactions, and some clinical measures. And I'm going to make that very concrete for you shortly. How we're bringing all these together, and that information is the central mechanism for triangulating, pun intended, uh, visual pun intended, uh, this process. There's lots of different ways that we can measure how the gene relates ultimately to uh, function. So I'll just uh, repeat for those who, are, who have forgotten all the basic biology, gene made of DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into protein. That's the dogma. There's some now interesting exceptions and, and wrinkles on that dogma, but good enough. And so you see now, through the a number of high throughput techniques, we're able to measure a percentage of the total ohm or uh, repertoire of that particular modality. So for instance, DNA sequencing, we know essentially the whole human genome. Genetic distance, which is how genes recombine, we know that. Um, for um, RNA sequencing, we know most of the 
RNA uh, molecules that get synthesized from the human genome. And increasingly, this is true of metabolites and proteins, we're getting increasingly comprehensive or omic measurements of all these uh, different measures. And the point of all this is that there is an opportunity, computationally speaking, to take all these different modalities against this, themselves and find ways that together they might actually tell us more information. You might, for instance, want to combine gene, gene disruption with, an, with a protein in absolute quantitation <laughs> or a tissue microarray with a protein localization study. And by combining these, these very comprehensive multimodality studies, you can actually make some traction. So our hypothesis that I'm going to try to uh, uh, suggest to you uh, in the remainder of this talk has, uh, holds water is that a multimodal approach to autism is necessary to understand it well enough to provide the least invasive and most effective treatment. <coughs> and the corollary is that computer science provides the essential language and the methodology of integration. So I'm going to give you, by way of making my argument, three tales of the integrome. The integrome is that ohm that integrates all these other ohms, the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome. So the first uh, tale, and sorry, my laptop is very slow, so I can never tell when it's about to actually do the thing or whether I need to click it again. There we go. So. For those of you who are men, as we all get older, sooner or later, someone's going to measure this very old school biomarker, prostate-specific antigen, and decide basis on that level that they measure whether or not to whack out this organ out between your legs. And hopefully that'll go well one way or the other. But it's not uncontroversial. And the reason why it's not uncontroversial um, will be explained to us during the, this talk. But the point that it, the reason we know it's controversial is look, there's 1,410 articles just describing the right way to interpret, interpret that prostate-specific antigen. And furthermore, there's 179 review articles. It's not uncontroversial, and some people choose not to do, some do well-informed doctors choose not even to do this test because they, uh, they feel so confused by this. And so what are we going to do now with measurement of thousands of gene products to actually systematically address this problem so we don't actually start removing everybody's breasts, uh, ovaries, and uh, prostates just because we have uh, some statistical flukes? So I think the real challenge is what people call biomar biomarkers, but what I call finding the true names of disease. Back a um, hundred years ago, I could do the moral equivalent of visiting a patient and diagnosing them with fever. Fever was a diagnosis. Now, you all may look at me and say, what the heck are you talking about? That's a, that's a symptom. But you think of all our, our modern uh, diseases. Diabetes mellitus, what does that mean? Sweet piss. Cancer, what does it mean? Uncontrolled growth. Uh, systemic lupus, what does that mean? Red bumps all over your body and the pains. Every single disease we have is a description of symptoms, the diagnosis of symptoms, not of disease, with just a few exceptions. Metabolic uh, diseases and infectious diseases, where the name of the disease is the name of infectious agent. But ex with exception of those diseases, our, diagno our diagnoses reflect our lack of understanding of the diseases, they're phenomenological descriptions, they're not etiological or mechanistic descriptions. And it's somewhat humbling as a physician to actually realize how backward we are in that respect. So we're not that far from diagnosing fever. Um, and so it's very important to go back a few hundred years to Linnaeus. Because Linnaeus had a similar problem. He had all these different factoids about these medicinal herbs that he was trying to compile for use in um, for use in, the, in medicine. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was the chemical screening of, the, of that time. And he couldn't do, make any headway because everything had a fancy Latin name that had, bore no relationship to the other. So he created the binomial system, whereby the first name told you what class the second name belonged to. So we are all of the homo uh, class. And for those of us who are computer nerds who program at night, it's a joke, but in fact, we're classified as Homo diurnus because uh, when he was making the classification, he viewed us correctly as not the nocturnal primates. There are, but of course, with lights and so on, we've switched, we've uh, flipped our cycles. But by having this binomial system, it's huge power because now you can classify like things together and start creating generalizations. And so the goal of the biomarker um, 
task is can we find a similar classification of diseases that reflects their true nature rather than some arbitrary um, historical accident of the way diseases were um, discovered. So let's start talking real computer applications. Then the NIH, with your tax dollars, has an institute called the National Library of Medicine. Within the National Library of Medicine, they have a database called the Gene Expression Omnibus, GEO. So probably not everybody in this room knows what a, a gene chip is, and I'll do the five-second version of it. It's a chip about this big, a piece of uh, silicon or glass, on which, you, which allows you to measure how, many, how much any of 30,000 genes are turned on and off. So for every gene, it'll tell you how much that gene is on or off. A lot of these projects result, therefore, in Excel spreadsheet describing for every gene how much that gene was on and off. Those Excel spreadsheets, essentially, get deposited into the gene expression omnibus. When I wrote this slide, there were 72,000 uh, samples, 72,000 microarrays. That's a huge number of samples, but it's, it's growing by at least 2,500 a month. So now, uh, since I wrote the slides, it's closer to, I think, uh, 85,000 microarrays. And these are organized into samples where they describe, they describe texturally what is the sample and as well as maintaining the equivalent of Excel spreadsheet describing how much the genes are turned on or off. And these can be, are freely downloadable. The National Library of Medicine used also your um, tax dollars, tens of millions for this dictionary effort, to create the Unified Medical Language System. It covers 130 biomedical vocabularies. It contains one million inter interrelated concepts with 20 million links between these concepts with a variety of semantic tags. And it covers human and model organisms. And it scales from the molecular to the physiological to the pathological. And to give you a sense of the UMLS, I call this my money to money slide. Because there's a, there's a billing diagnosis vocabulary, how you bill Medicare for things. It's called ICD-9. This is the ICD-9 code for diabetes mellitus, which relates to this UMLS concept, which through a co-occurrence tag relates to fat cells, mature fat cells, adipocytes, and so on, which through a co-occurrence link, uh, link links to cyclic AMP, which then through a synonymy link uh, relates to adipogenesis, the generation of fat, which then through another link uh, links to another money database, which is the database of NIH grants. So you can find all the NIH grants uh, funded for adipogenesis. So it gives you a flavor of the interrelationship of these, uh, here a smattering of these 130 uh, biomedical vocabularies. So let's bring it all together. This is what we did. We took the descriptions of these samples that are sometimes organized into series and curated data sets, but that's a detail that does not matter here. We took the descriptions of these samples and using natural language processing, extracted from that description of these experiments the thousands of diseases or disease processes or biological processes described in these experiments. From the same um, samples, we obtained the gene expression values. So everybody following me so far? We have extracted from them the concepts and the gene expression measurements. Yes? The natural language processing is of what, of journal No, of the textual descriptions that people entered into the description their very noisy textual description of the experiment as they deposit them into GEO. Oh, okay. So there's no standard they're, they're free text, right? They're, 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 well, as one of my colleagues said, there's no such thing as free text. It's very expensive. Um, <laughs> because when it's free or narrative, then you have to spend a lot of money to codify it. And the, I don't want to get the, um, uh, diverted, but let me tell you, I run a national center for biomedical computing, as does Ron Kikinis, and we found more and more that the <laughs> computational task, which I, my PhD in computer science was around representation, it was not around uh, natural language processing, but natural language processing is going to be the most perhaps important data mining tool for, uh, in terms of getting the data in the first place for the foreseeable future, because most clinical records are not codified, most uh, texts are not codified or partially codified, and same for experiments. It's very hard. Last time you ordered something over on Amazon.com, remember how, how much time it took you to just click through all those things to order one book. Think about the poor slob clinician who has to enter 100 fields in a course of a 10-minute uh, visit. It's just not going to happen. But that's a talk uh, for another day. Back to our narrative. Uh, we have extracted into these UMLS codes the natural language that was associated with these microarrays, and we um, have the gene expression measurement for each of these rays. And whoops, 
And I'm going to first show you the result of just taking the, the uh, codes describing the experiments, not the genes themselves, just the textual descriptions, and see what happens when you cluster the data together using a simple correlational measure. And so we'll look at number one, and we'll see that what we've clustered is all the muscle concepts. So th that's nothing to, go, to write home about. You know, I could figure out other ways to search for muscle cops, concepts, but we actually did that for all the concepts that were in these uh, now 85,000. So all the things about aging, all the things about diabetes, all the things about heart attacks, all those concepts have been populated and related to these samples. And now what we're going to do is the following. We're going to take for every such concept, like the aging concept, what were the genes that were upregulated, uh, that were turned on high in, in the aging concept? What were the genes that were turned down in the aging concept? And we'll do that for every single concept. So for instance, what are the genes that are turned up in heart attacks versus down in heart attacks? What are the genes that are turned up in uh, st stomach ulcers and down in stomach ulcers? And now we're gonna, this is part of the True Names project. We're going to relate the diseases to one another by how much they share the diseases that are up and down. And what we find, lo and behold, is that there are many genes, there are many diseases that get near to one another in ways we had not expected. Like, for instance, inflammation is a common theme among many diseases. And so you see the inflammatory genes hooking together a number of disease processes that don't get normally taxonomized together in a, th in a textbook because textbooks reflect the medical organizational hierarchy of the way medical medicine is taught and practiced. So cardiology stuff not, does not necessarily sit next to stomach stuff when, in fact, we found in the following uh, tree, this, this nasty uh, graph is that new nosology that we published in Nature Biotechnology uh, earlier this year of all these uh, diseases um, related to one another through their actual gene expression relatedness rather than through um, some arbitrary nosology. Please. Did you need to have those geo Oh, yes. To do that? Because we needed, for each chip, we had to know what disease or process does it relate to. Right, so, but you used the full descriptions rather than the keywords. Because that's not, that's, it's, it's grossly in, inadequate. Okay. So from, from the descriptions, you extracted some. We extracted all the concepts into the UMLS, Unified Medical Language System. So we could, they have something called concept IDs, CUIs, and, uh, and we extracted, so now we have a standard vocabulary. So you took that as your standard vocabulary, you looked for that standard vocabulary and, and tagged each sample exactly. according to which of that, the terms in that standard vocabulary Correct. occurred there. Correct. Okay. By the way, this doesn't work perfectly. I'm sparing you from a lot of funny details of things that were mis miscoded, uh, they were, those they were in the article. It, it's one person, one rat, one something. One, one thing. One thing. So, so well, it, it's, a vector, it's a vector of, let's say, 30,000 for that one. But for each one of these diseases, there's basically either one and one, or there's Oh, yes. Okay. This doesn't work if there's right, more than one. Really right. Close. So how many are there? Today? So there's, there's, hundreds, there's hundreds of diseases. Hundreds of diseases, but for each disease, she's asking how many samples? How many samples? Oh, per sample. I mean, how many samples per disease? Yeah. For the biggies, there's, there's um, hundreds or a thousand uh, microarrays. For cancer, there's tens of thousands of microarrays. Five, five or six, and those will not those will end up getting excluded because we have to have some sort of statistical uh, false discovery rate. Uh, we have to reduce the false positive rate, and so those get where the numbers are too small per disease, they don't end up in this nosology. <laughs> and so, just to give you a feeling of, of what this looks, these are the different concepts, and this is this horrible graph that relates these concepts to the genes. So, what can you do with that? Well. First of all, you realize the following. If you look here on the x-axis, <coughs> these are different samples of different uh, tissues. And each one of these is a gene that was, in this case, said to be associated with a muscle concept. And shown in gray are actual human validated. These were muscle concepts. And what you see, of course, reassuringly, is the muscle concepts are on the high end of this, uh, of this uh, gene. But you also see that a whole bunch of non-muscle concepts are also involved with that gene at lowering levels of expression. And as a result, every now and then, uh, Jeff Drazen, the, journal, the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, will send me a paper where they say, I've discovered a new biomarker for X. And I look it up in this database, and sure enough, X is expressed in that disease, but also in disease Y, Z, and D. 
at the different levels under different conditions. And the point is, by only looking at the entire integrome can you understand the real specificity of a biomarker. And that's, going back to the original story, why the prostate-specific antigen is a bad test. Because it's looking with one uh, variable at a very complex disease that has a lot of other things that can make it go up. <coughs> and just to illustrate it very concrete, concretely, for instance, related to the aging concept, we found 11 genes. Two of them are known to be associated with aging. G6PDH, name of a gene, with a very significant p-value, was found uh, associated with the aging concept. And individuals with uh, G6PDH deficiency have been noted to have health from cardiovascular disease and increased longevity. BDNF has been previously shown to have significant drop in expression in skin fibroblasts with aging. And there are people working on actually trying to engineer that for beautiful skin forever. But here I give you for free um, a, another, another uh, set of genes that were in, associated with in this exactly uh, similar p-values to the aging concept just as well. And so I'm giving you, pardon? What are p-values? Ah, OK. P-values are a measure of how likely are you to have this finding by chance. Because if I ask enough qu questions, eventually I'll, get, I'll hear the answer I want. And so if I ask a question only once and I get the answer I want, that's pretty low likely. If I ask it a million times, then it becomes more likely that I'll get the answer I want. So a p-value is a probability, is a measure of how likely would I be to get this answer by chance. And so, for instance, in regular, regular clinical trials, a p-value of 5% is acceptable. Um, when you're measure, looking at a lot of genes, you get very worried about p-values as high as that. So you're much more reassured when you have p-values that are down in the 10 to the minus 6 level. Absolutely. Exactly right. In fact, the whole problem of genomics is because of the noisiness and the number of genes, you get overwhelmed by false positives. In fact, pharma was initially very excited about these microarrays, but then they were not careful about the false positive issue, and they, they, even they did not have enough money to follow all the leads that were false positives. Yes? So these two genes were previously known, and so I'm giving you a typical bioinformatics argument which is these two genes previously known and identified without me telling the system. It, it automatically identified them you know, with the aging concept. Without doing anything else, with just as good p-values, it identified these other genes which, for which this has not been identified. Which not, and so that it says that perhaps this is a, a hypothesis generation machine. And so remember, we're not doing this for aging. We're doing this for all the concepts that are described in uh, GEO. I can make up stories, but there's something called, yeah. but there's something called gene staring syndrome, which is you stare at any list of genes, and you can say, oh, this causes this, and this causes that, and that causes aging, of course. But th those three um, uh, uh, um, inductive steps actually are highly suspect because it just, it's too easy to do. Can I ask one other sure. question? Are you, are you assuming some kind of underlying parametric disposition? Non-parametric. Non-parametric. Non we, no, we got, no. We, we, we did non-parametric uh, tests and fa false discovery controlled, and that blew away a lot of things that might have been otherwise there. Okay, again, I'm, I'm waiting to see. I'll click it one more time with feeling. So this is work that was done about six years ago by one of my former students, uh, Atul Butte, who's now uh, assistant professor at Stanford. And he took this very nice shot of a chapel here in Harvard Square. And it said on it, nothing unconnected ever occurs. And to, what did that mean to us? It meant to us that um, in order for a cell to exist, all events within it have to be coordinated in order for it to be able to respond to an environmental stimulus, like there's glucose around, let me get the machinery in place to burn glucose. There's, um, uh, I've been told to die through the cell death program. Let me put, get the machinery going. And going, getting machinery going means a bunch of things has to have, be correlated together in order for it to happen. In order for us to end up in this room now, all our patterns focusing on this room had to be correlated before uh, this uh, event. And yet, obviously, some things are more correlated than others, and the people who never made it to this room, of course, are the least correlated. 
And I have a version of this talk that is in the Bayesian framework, but to illustrate my point, I'm keeping it in a purely simple correlational uh, framework, which makes it, I think, a little bit easier to understand. So if you look at any patient, you can, if you wish, view them as, an, as a, a vector. So this patient has a lab test, a lab test, a clinical parameter, an RNA expression level, how much that gene is switched on, and the susceptibility to an anti-cancer agent. And this is actually a pretty sparse matrix. I've shown here only one missing value, but there's obviously <coughs> typically a lot of missing values. And here's a second patient where you've measured these things, and another patient where, you, where you've measured these things. And so one thing that you might want to do is just take any pair of these variables, plot them as a scatter plot, and see how they relate to one another. And you summarize that scatter plot simply by having, by the way, hands up those of you who are computer scientists by training. All right, so I'm okay-ish. So you can summarize this by a graph where each node is a variable and the edge, the link, is a correlation a coefficient. And if you want to get fancy, you can have the, the width of the edge there be corresponding to the correlation coefficient. But suffice to say, we're showing that these two variables, lab test two and susceptibility to anti-cancer agent, are correlate, correlated with a correlation coefficient of 0.65. That's all. And then we do the typical um, computer science bravado thing, which is you calculate all the possibilities. So you take all the clinical parameters you saw in that spreadsheet, you calculate all the possible co correlations between every single variable. And then you say you pick a statistically significant threshold for correlation, which I can tell you about later, and you cut all the links that are below that threshold, all the correlations that are less than that threshold. And what you're left with is groups of islands of nodes that remain connected by links that are stronger than that correlation. And we call those remaining islands relevance networks because their correlation is stronger than that uh, threshold of relevance. And so here, this is again, this is work actually we did in 1999. It shows a, a yeast network. And as you dial down the correlation coefficient on the left, it shows that more and more genes are being pulled in to the network. Um, and in fact, you see that this is, uh, you we never go below 0.95, which is a very high, this is, uh, a scale that goes between essentially 0 and 1, and we never go down below 0.95 here because otherwise the screen would be full. And the, the point is a lot of genes have to be tightly correlated in, for, in order for the cell to survive. So let me give you a quick experiment to illustrate the point about finding new drugs. Remember, in the end, I'm going to bring this back to, to autism, but I'm trying to show you the various parts of use of computational techniques to triangulate. So the first tale that I told you about was finding biomarkers. The second tale I'm talking about is finding new drugs. So back when um, Affymetrix was, uh, a, which is a ch company that makes these uh, gene chips, was much more primitive, we worked with a colleague of ours, Todd Golub, one of my former interns actually at Children's Hospital, on the following project. Um, we took um, data from the National Cancer Institute. The National, National Inst Cancer Institute National Cancer Institute spends your money by testing 60 cancer cell lines with thousands of compounds that are putative anti-cancer agents. So, uh, some of them are genuine drugs from uh, drug companies, some are dust from China, extracts of plants from Amazon, you name it. There's tens of thousands of these drugs. We took a validated subset of these, 5,000 drugs for which we knew the effect of each of those 5,000 drugs against each of the 60 different cancers. These were cancers with bone cancer, liver cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, and so on. On the same 60 uh, cancers, we measured 6,000 genes. Now there's 30,000 genes in the genome, more or less, or less, but at the time they were measuring only 6,000. And so we had the following kind of weird uh, data analysis problem. We had 60 cancers, for which we had measured the effect of 5,000 anti-cancer agents and 6,000 genes. So we have 11,000 variables across 60 cell lines. Now, you don't even have to be a computer scientist to realize you have a problem here. If you have one variable, how many equations do you need to solve a linear system? One. Thank you. <laughs> Normally, I have to wait for an undergraduate to actually be uh, not embarrassed to say that. And if you have two uh, variables, you need two equations. And if you have tens of thousands of variables, you need lots and lots of equations. And so this is a very underdetermined system. There's more than one solution to this. There's more than one way that the action, the changes of the genes might explain the anti-cancer agents. 
We did not let that deter us because we believed there were strong signals here and we were going to discover them all, or at least the low-hanging ones, through relevance networks. So we computed the relevance networks, all the correlations, and then, and this resulted in, let's see, 68 million correlations. Of those, only 1,200 were supra-threshold, were above a correlation of 0.8, which was a statistically significant threshold that we obtained through a randomization test that I can describe after the talk. And there were lots of gene-gene uh, correlations that were higher and a lot of drug-drug interactions that were, that were higher than 0.8. So just to keep the audience awake, why were there a lot of gene-gene correlations above uh, 0.8? Why? Thank you, because genes do not in act independently because of the program. Why were there a lot of drug-drug correlations? They target, the same they target the same mechanism, copycat drugs, and so on. Exactly right. Now, God or evolution did not um, evolve, grow, create genes together with anti-cancer agents. So there's no particular reason why there should be any high correlation the two, between the two. So we were very lucky that there was one link between a uh, gene and an anti-cancer agent that was super threshold. And what we found was that this gene which we'll describe in a second, the more this gene was expressed, the more sensitive that cancer was to this uh, drug. In other words, it didn't matter which cancer you were. The more this was expressed, the higher this level, the more sensitive you were to, to, to this. And the biological details don't matter very much for the purpose of this talk. Suffice it to say, this is something called LCP1 or L-plastin. It's been thought to occur in most, common, in most human cancer cell lines. A uh, role for it has been implicated for development of tumors. And um, this drug is this unpronounceable thing on the second line. It's a, a kind of drug called a thiazolidine carboxylic acid derivative, which are also known as the uh, as same class as the oral hypoglycemic agents. They are known, some of them, to inhibit tumor cell growth. And moreover, when we published this in PNAS in 2000, a group at the NCI afterwards showed in, in, in vitro that if they turned on the expression of this gene in one cell line, indeed, the cell line became more resistant to that drug. And so we had gone through 68 million uh, correlations that actually found a, a genuine target in a purely computational fashion. Rescuing the univariate. Don't worry, I'll get you in time for uh, the... Um, Reception. I don't know what happened to PowerPoint. I'm about to switch to the other um, the keynote thing, which it runs on Max. So I'm sure you've all heard about the Genome Project. Amazingly, ended ended uh, up uh, under budget, a huge success. Um, in fact, someone here played no small part in it. Um, and we were not done when we had, I just sequenced the full genome because that was just a handful of genomes, only what, one of whose genome we know, Craig Venter. Uh, but what makes us, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. Right, and so, I mean, that, that gives a genetic, um, I, I coined a new term to describe Craig based on this, information exhibitionism. Uh, so, but of course, when you were trying to understand human disease, since we're not exactly the same, thank God, it's actually variations around the human genome that matters. And I'm going to try to spare you the details so I can make my point. But so if you can catch up with me in terms of basic vocabulary, so there's a, a, a genetic sequence. Uh, and the polymorphism is when you have a difference in sequence. And a single nucleotide polymorphism is when the difference in sequence is only for one base. And here you see a T to G polymorphism. And just because it's terminology and nothing, about, nothing deep, uh, a SNP, by definition, not through any scientific reason, is typically said to have to occur at the, in at least 1% of the population. And they are the most common type of variants, uh, are the ones known. If you look at individuals and look at things that are not common, we probably have maybe 10 times as many variants which are private to us, our families, and our immediate lineages. And there's three types of SNPs that it's worth talking about. A SNP that occurs, a base change in a coding region, and the thing that is going to become a protein. In a, reg a regulatory SNP, 
that um, is going to occur in a place that regulates how much the genes are turned on, and a synonymous SNP, which makes no, is in the, in the coding region, but doesn't really change the amino acid because more than one, uh, more than one triplet of uh, ACTG can correspond to one amino acid. And so when you look at a bunch of individuals, where here every line is individual, you see here uh, what their genotypes are. We see in uh, blue when the individual on that row has the common SNP in this position. Here he has a common, he or, he or she has a common SNP. Here she has a common SNP. And here she is a heterozygote. She has both uh, SNPs. And here this person has, is homozygous for the, more, the less frequent SNP. So I'm going to tell you a factoid, and then just to keep you awake, you're going to tell me the answer. It's probably a good bet now that it really is the case that we all came out of Africa and that there was a bottleneck of individuals, maybe at less than 100, who came out of Africa from which all the non-African populations in the world um, come from. Based on that, uh, let's, put a, let's draw a line. Are the African Americans above or below the line? See, I'm, I'm really trying to pull Larry Summers. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, uh, yeah, and everybody's afraid to answer. So, okay, so I'll, sp I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the, 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 uh, the anguish. It turns out this is the, the Africans. Why is it? Because there's much more genetic diversity. They were this huge population, and in fact, um, it's very interesting. If you look at African Americans, you can actually subgroup them by their uh, port of entry because they were different, pulled out of different uh, regions of Africa into slavery, and the different port of entry actually defined where they came from in Africa. And so different parts of the country will have a preponderance of different SNPs. But the bottom line is that they're much more uh, genetically heterogeneous than uh, whites or Asians. So the game that we play using these SNPs is to, we, we're interested in, um, a gene that causes the disease, in a variant that causes the disease. But we don't know how to measure it directly. We just can pepper the genome with markers that are associated with the phenotype. In other words, if you see this marker lot, that you can predict that you're going to have that phenotype. And if these markers are laid densely down, densely enough on the entire genome, we hope it'll be close enough to implicate the uh, causative genotype. And in uh, the interest of time, I'm not going to um, go spend time on that previous slide about linkage disequilibrium. Still today, but less, increasingly less so when we're now able to measure all the SNPs in the human genome, individuals have done studies where they pick through the literature a number of genes, a handful of genes, and they say, okay, I'm looking at um, uh, this process, let's say stroke, and let me find all the genes that have been implicated in stroke. And I'm going to use, then I'm going to look at all the SNPs in the genes that I implicated in stroke, let's say 200 genes, and see if any of those SNPs in those genes that make sense for being involved in stroke have a different frequency in patients who've had stroke versus those who didn't have stroke. So let me give you an example of a successful genomic study of the future. In African Americans, as you well know, uh, sickle cell disease is a um, monogenic disorder. If you have the variant, you have the disease. And um, a subgroup of these individuals will have stroke before 18 years of age, which is not the usual time people have stroke. And um, since only 68% of these individuals have stroke, clearly it's not just the primary uh, hemoglobin uh, mutation that's causing the disease. Can we find the other genes that are contributing to this risk? Again, for the interest of time, I will skip on what, this, uh, study, what the study details were. But here's the point. A group at BU first published this data where they looked at each individual gene and said, what is the, um, the odds ratio, what was the likelihood of seeing one variant more in the stroke population in kids with sickle cell disease versus those that did not? And they barely had a significance uh, after a multiple hypothesis correcting on one gene and not on the others. And so essentially it was negative. They published in a very reputable journal essentially a negative result. No variants were predicted, additional variants were predicted of stroke. Uh, 
So then one of my colleagues, uh, Marco Ramoni, who's a Bayesian statistician, computer scientist, I should say, he's a German by the statistician, um, actually uh, did the following study using um, uh, a, a Bayesian uh, network induction model. So I just quickly remind everybody um, some basic uh, theory of causality. You can actually say that uh, shoe size and literacy is correlated, right? And therefore, and that's true, right? And therefore, if you uh, um, increase the shoe size of kids, uh, they'll become more illiterate. I, mean, I think that's a lo logical conclusion. But of course, if you add a new variable in there, A, then these two things become conditionally independent. And you understand that shoe size is not going to uh, affect those. And it's really it's through covariant through age. Uh, well, uh, you, you could. Numbers. Yeah, you do have numbers. That's exactly right. And what you do is, with, with these two alone, with these two alone, you can't. If that's all I give you, the universe, you can't. But if I give you a universe with these three, what I have to find out is, across all my experiments, will this will, what's the most likely model? Are these two varying as a function of this or as a function of each other? You can actually, because. You can actually measure the likelihood by looking at each instance, each row, each measurement, saying, oh, there are cases where this changed and these, uh, and, uh, and these both changed, but they did not, ch um, let's see, um, I'm trying to say this in an um, obvious way. So there may, there may be instances where this will change and this will change, but this, uh, this will change and this doesn't. But every time this changed, they both changed. That would prove to you that that was the case. And of course, never th things are never that clear cut. And so you actually have to measure um, as follows. Well, basically, you, c you create all the possible graphs between uh, the variables. And you're actually going to calculate which models are most probable based on all the possible topologies of these graphs and uh, all the uh, appropriate weightings of, these, of those edges given the data. More formally, you're actually going to calculate the probability of the model given the data, assuming this very simple uh, Bayesian transformation. And because I'm running out of time and I want to get back to the, base, to the autism story, I, can just, I want to say that uh, they actually did the study for the stroke, indi uh, individual stroke identified a number of genes. These are each encapsulating multiple markers within uh, each gene. And they found remarkably uh, good uh, risk predictions on combinations of variants. In other words, although you could not predict with one variant at a time, by looking at variants across these genes, they were able to say the following combinations give you very significant risks. And so they could actually predict who had the stroke with an accuracy of 98%. So if they went from a failure study to a multigenic predictor study, so a failure study in a single gene uh, modality to a multigenic predictor that was 98.2%, uh, and in a, um, in a, um, Second population, they actually uh, repeated the same predictor, and they got 88%. I mean, of course, they did all the usual things that you do in computer science, like cross-validation. But when you do the same population, it's never particularly convincing. They did it with the second population, and it got extremely good um, accuracy, as you can see, 88%. And this was published in Nature Genetics. And I actually do think it's a new model of how to actually uh, use all these variants uh, together to, to, uh, to, to find um, a, a, a complex disease. So in the interest of time, I want to move forward to the autism story. How do we extract uh, knowledge from this quagmire? Look at all, here's just sampling all these different papers that anybody who's a, a researcher in autism has to understand, relating all these different variants uh, to, um, to autism. And to, in a nutshell, there is a, a very powerful um, area, again, of natural language processing, 
where we and others are working to link genes to diseases by actually mining the literature for these relationships. So this is work that was done by one of my colleagues at Columbia, Andrei Andrew, uh, Andrei Rzhetsky, and um, he was able to identify this subgraph of uh, processes involved in apoptosis just by reading literature. Now, that might sound unimpressive to you because, after all, it's just not recreating what we, what we already know. The point is you never can find one paper that has all of this or one diagram like this or one set of knowledge that allow you to look at a microarray experiment like this. And so that's exactly what we're planning to do for autism. We're creating a biblium workbench that allows you to actually go into literature, pull out of li literature all the noun phrases describing disease processes related to autism and the genes that have been implicated to in, with those disease processes in the literature and see how they relate to see if we can then prior prioritize which genes we're further going to study. And so we're, we're going to do exactly the same trick that you saw, the, the Bayesian multigenic prediction trick for all those, if you recall, I showed you the 10 genome-wide studies that were done for autism that did not result in any genes coming up to um, reproducibility. And we're going to try to come up with the same kind of integrating gen genome-wide scans for autism. And I apologize for the poor quality of the picture, but we actually have um, now some interesting candidates just based on this uh, Bayesian integrative approach where we're look, combining multiple such studies and rescuing them from their uni univariate focus to a multivariate approach. Um, I'll just, I just want to close with some thoughts about the uni uh, ubiquitous transcriptome. So we have 30,000 30, genes, and those genes have to essentially do everything to regulate and make a cell, to make a cell membrane, to uh, to build the mitochondria, to build the nucleus, to build all the replication bit, uh, materials, to build channels in and out of cells. All that stuff is, it has, is, the, is the task of the genes that are then transcribed into mRNA and that are then transcribed into protein. And as I was getting more and more involved in functional genomics, I, I started seeing that again and again, the same gene names that I was used to seeing in one area, let's say muscle disease, I was beginning to see in other areas. And um, in all these different, uh, these different systems, I was seeing again and again the same genes. And it occurred to me, and I think it's occurred to several other people, that that is because in order just to be a cell of the most vanilla type, you have to have all this functionality working. And that's already a huge order. The, the remainder, the being a nerve cell or being a liver cell or being a blood cell, is just the icing on top. Because all this, whole, all this huge amount of uh, plumbing that has to work in the first place, and the, the rest of it is relatively, uh, it is incredibly important, but relatively minor uh, specialization. And consequently, because every cell has to have, more or less every cell has to have the mitochondria or the transport mechanisms, the transcriptome is going to be shared across these um, different tissues. And that realization was important because in autism, unlike cancer, no one's going to give me a piece, thank God, of a kid's brain to measure the gene expression. But if indeed a lot of the transcriptome is shared with white blood cells, and we're lucky enough that, and in fact, by the way, I can qu quantify, between 60 to 80% of the transcriptome is shared across all cells in the human body. So if we're lucky enough that there is a gene that's dysregulated um, in the human brain, in the cerebellum, for instance, um, that causes autism, that there is a chance that we'll be able to pick up its dysfunction in the white blood cells. And I can give you uh, analogous situations. Tay-Sachs disease. What kills the children is the buildup of uh, products of metabolism in the brain, and it causes cell death in their brain and blind, or blindness and then death. It's a horrible disease. But if you look at their liver or the white blood cells, you can see the same inclusion bodies of these unprocessed, um, unprocessed byproducts, but it doesn't kill them because the, the white cells are not as vulnerable as the, um, as the brain cells. And the bet we're taking is that there may be a lesion in the genetic apparatus that's present in the brain and it's not clinically manifest otherwise in the, in the white blood cells, but we can actually measure it. And so right now, we're actually in the process of um, um, enrolling kids with autism, and we're going to do exactly uh, the kind of stratification that I told you before about the integrome. We're going to try to find the true names of autism, because right now autism looks like one broad spectrum, 
And then we're pretty sure that by looking at it in this fashion, we're going to find subgroups of autism with different outcomes. And after the fact, we know clinically that there are some kids who will do better with behavioral therapy, some kids who will regress no matter what you do. And we're hoping that this will allow us to create a signature for early intervention and for uh, prediction. But it may be able to do <coughs> something more than that. And by the way, this is just early clustering of our results uh, five months ago to suggest that there is some similarity. But if you actually project these individuals into principled component space, and I apologize to those who are not mathematically uh, uh, inclined, but basically each one of these balls is a patient, and it's in a space where we're capturing a lot of the variance of these patients. And so um, if these are a lot of normal patients, and here's a mix of normal and affected individuals, it'd be very nice to be able to start seeing if we can use some therapies to push the, the transcriptome of these individuals into in this area, because that would be the first evidence that we actually could have a real treatment for, uh, for autism. And so for instance, right now we're enrolling kids in schools and looking at their behavioral therapy and see if the behavioral therapy is pushing them in the, in the direction of normality. This will give us a basis, perhaps, of uh, evaluating our treatments. So it's the, it's the moral equivalent of high throughput screening for cancer, but for, uh, for autism. And so another uh, thing that we're going to be doing in the integral is taking genes that are differentially expressed in these kids and seeing if they fall under any of those linkage peaks that I showed you in those genome-wide scans. That will make us also believe more that those genes are involved. And most important, it's a social integral. And so we actually have regular meetings between myself, Luke Kunkel, who's head of genomics at Children's, Lenny Rapport, who runs the Developmental Medicine Center, and Mike Greenberg, who who runs neuroscience. And we have interactions which are diagrammed something like this. So for example, uh, Lenny enrolls a, a patient. We do expression profiling. We're finding out which uh, disease genes we believe might be involved based on gene expression. Lou does resequencing and linkage studies on these. And if we have some good candidates, um, Mike Greenberg actually can ex express these genes in the rat cultures and see if they can affect the arborization the um, tree-like patterning of the dendrites of these developing neurons. And I want to point out that this is largely, although the primary data are obviously not computational, the discovery mechanism here is fundamentally a computational mechanism. Because the signal is so weak, done there, and either prospectively mining it through national, uh, retrospectively mining it through natural language processing, or prospectively through annotation of uh, text. And I, I'm talking to now some colleagues of mine, for instance, at Science Commons, who are interested in this global uh, idea of neurocommons, and they have some ideas about Markov, and I think we will have some interesting things to talk about. Higher order probabilistic integromics, I think, is another um, area of collaboration. How do you actually bring together these modalities of fundamental different scales and ordinality. Um, how do you integrate larger comparative data sets? Like I talked about integrating GEO from uh, the Gene Expression Omnibus with those other data sets. How do you create collaborative networks so that all these different types of individuals can actually contribute to understanding how these sets of genes work? And f focusing down on those variants that actually matter mechanistically is an interesting computational challenge. And with that, I thank you.